A Manifesto for Hope. Principle 9. People follow people, not disembodied principles. Many of our government-funded systems are failing the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. At the same time, we're sidelining our greatest national asset, local people. We have a stark choice. To keep pouring money into policies we know aren't working or to invest in new and better ways that really improve people's lives. We need a radical reset, one that empowers local charities, grassroots movements and faith groups in a more imaginative, less bureaucratic, more collaborative approach to community development. I'm Steve Chalk. My book, A Manifesto for Hope, sets out 10 tried and tested practical principles for how to develop joined up cost-effective, community-empowering work, each gleaned from the hard-won experience that sat at the heart of my work over the past four decades. It culminates in a call for a new social covenant, one that will transform the life chances of countless young people and families. It's time to reimagine. It's time for a manifesto for hope. Principle 9. People follow people, not disembodied principles. With my guest and expert witness, Derek Evans, MBE. Fitness instructor, keynote speaker and TV personality, also known as Mr. Motivator. Hi, Derek. <laughs> Hello, Stevie. I yeah. love that introduction. <laughs> yeah, well, you. I should say, before we say anything else, you motivate me to get up at half six or, well, actually, to get on screen at half six and do a workout with you three times a week. You know Please. what? Because I think it's – you remember the conversation we had and we were talking about you work so hard in doing work for other people, looking after other people. But, you know, yourself is important. What you do about you is important. And often we neglect our health, and it's only when we get down the road, years later, we go, I wish I had. And I want as many people to start putting movement into their life because I believe that movement is medicine and it's something we should all take. Movement is medicine. And that's really what this theme is all about. People follow people, not disembodied mm. principles. You are the ideal person to talk about this. But just to get us going, in the chapter of my book, I tell the story of Moses, you know, the um, the Middle Bronze Age leader that we've all heard of, you know, set my people people free, let my people mm. free. And is great uh, this great story about how this man uh, takes on the most powerful dictator in the world, the Egyptian pharaoh, and demands that the Hebrew people can be set free from their slavery, mm. journey to their promised land. And what I say mm. in the book is it's a brilliant story, of course, and it's mm. inspired endless people since Martin Luther mm. King, for one, who in many of his speeches just quotes Moses uh, mm. Let my people go. Let my people go. Freedom, freedom. But the question I always ask myself about it over the years I've known this story, which has lived with me all my life, really, or since childhood, is how come the, the Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt for 400 years before a Moses arose to say, let my people go? And I can't imagine that for 400 years of slavery, they worked as brickmakers, as you probably know. They never mm. had a day off. They were driven like machines. Their lives were worth nothing. They were slaves. They were put down and repressed and oppressed by this giant Egyptian machine. Mm. I can't imagine that over those 400 years, they didn't tell stories of what life was like when they had freedom before they were locked into slavery. Mm. I can't imagine. They didn't tell stories about what it would be like if they were ever free, if things were ever different. They must have written poems and sung songs. They must have sat around campfires in snatched conversations talking about the burden of slavery and the hope of freedom. But they must have done all of that. But in 400 years, all of that thinking, all of that longing, all of that hoping, all of that frustration, all of that pain, never resulted in a Moses. Now, was it because nobody had ever thought that you could go to the Pharaoh and demand freedom? Or was it because nobody ever had the courage to do it? Maybe, 
that didn't know what freedom is or was. Because I'll always remember, do you remember Roots? In the story of Roots, right, which was blacks in America, blacks in America were enslaved in many ways, same modern day situation. They didn't know what freedom was. He came from Africa. Mm. And when he arrived, okay, on the boat, he said to the people, don't you long for freedom? And I'll always remember Fiddler going, what is freedom? He had to paint a picture of what freedom is. And that, of course, is the point. Actually, that's what I say. I didn't use that story in the book, but that's a brilliant story and brilliant illustration. What Moses did, he didn't just say, let my people go to Pharaoh. What he Mm. did for the people, the Hebrew people, was paint a picture of of a promised land, of a promised Mm. land. He Mm. literally called it the promised land. So it's one thing to be stuck in the old land, but you don't realize there's anything more. So a leader, a real motivator of people, mm-hmm. which is why it's so brilliant, you're Great doing a picture. podcast, a motivator mm-hmm. of people is someone who points you to what you mm-hmm. perhaps wouldn't otherwise see, not only describes how you're stuck in the old land, but much more importantly, talks about the new land. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Uh, I reflect in my book about the fact that it's not just Moses, of course, it's Nelson Mandela did it, Emmeline Pankhurst did it, Gandhi did it, Martin Luther King did it, Mother Teresa did it, Greta Thunberg does it. All of these people point you to a new land, a better land. And, And I think that it's not that they have detailed maps of the new land. Moses didn't. Martin Luther King in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, he didn't have a detailed map of what America could be beyond giving the vote to black people who were disenfranchised, beyond Mm. creating equal opportunity in, in employment for them. He didn't know quite what it would look like, but he could paint a a good enough picture of it to call people towards it. And, and one of the things about, Martin Luther King, of course, is that we all remember him, but he worked with a team. He was the pioneer. He pointed to the future. But to use a different illustration, I was talking to someone that I work with this morning, and she was saying, oh, Steve, you're a pioneer. And I said, yeah, but pioneers can point the way. They can even find the new land. But then other people need to come and do the landscaping. They need, <laughs> they need to work out how the transport systems work. They need to develop the infrastructure. So the pioneering leader is really important, but their job is to show all that there is a new land that can be inhabited so that they come with you into that place, which is why, actually, in Oasis, as Oasis has grown over the last 40 years, People often, um, in fact, I was doing a, a television interview the other day, and and they always ask ask me how to introduce myself, you know, and and they say, "So you're the boss, you're the CEO," and I say, "No, I'm not the CEO," and they look shocked. I say, "No, I'm not the CEO." Actually, I tell them who is the CEO. We got several CEOs of the different parts of Oasis, but I say I'm not any of them. I don't do that. I'm the founder. And the other day, someone said, well, what does a founder do? I said, well, I started the thing, but really my job is to point the way, but it's not to get in the way, to point the way, not to get in the way of everyone else. What I've done over the years is I have been the CEO of various bits of Oasis. I was the CEO of our schools. I was CEO of our housing. I was the endless bits of Mm. Oasis. I've Mm. been the CEO, but I know my job is to vacate that chair and to keep pointing the way to the the new future thing, to be a kind of movement person. Sure. Well, let an older person give you some wisdom. You may and not you be are old. I just want to point out that you are <laughs> older. <laughs> I just want to point out I look younger. <laughs> <laughs> but if you ever get asked that question in the future, can I suggest you do this? Tell people that you're the conductor. Hmm. You know the tune that your organization needs to play but you can't play all the instruments. So you have someone in charge of the woodwind section, someone in charge of the string section, and all you do is because you know the tune and how that finished piece wants to be, you just stand in front and you literally conduct. 
And that's the easiest way to handle it, because in many ways, that's probably what I do with myself on a smaller basis. I have lots of people who deal with different elements of what I'm about, but I'm the one who has the vision of where I'm going to take things. And when you talk about vision, Steve, what you were talking about in terms of influence, isn't it amazing how we're using, we're saying we've got lots of influencers. They're all on television, on social media, they're influencers. That type of influencer has no depth to it because all they, they do is they take up a product and they go, I've tried this product and I like it. The real influencers were someone like your Moses, like your Martin Luther King, who looked at where you were in life and they go, you know what? I have a vision of something which is far better than where you are. And I want to paint that picture of what that is. And I want you to have faith in what I'm going to say. Yeah. Mm. There's no faith in the modern influencer who sits on the screen and gives you, gives you this. But that took faith for a lot of people to go on that march with Martin Luther King. It took faith on all the people to follow Moses, right? Mm. And that's the important thing. And it's only when that faith disappears do you get a breakdown. Yeah. As long as people keep faith in what that influence is giving them, then your mission becomes so much more interesting and and uh, and viable and successful. Yeah, yeah. So what I find in life, well, in actual fact, I got a friend who once said to me years ago. They, he said, "We're all born into a box called conformity. From our first days, we're taught what the rules of life are, and we're taught how to conform, how to fit in." Schools do that, et cetera, et cetera. Our culture does that. He said, what a real leader is, is someone, and he put it like this, who can be a heretic. They don't go for the old orthodoxy, the way things have to be done. They can see a different way. They're heretics. And he said, if you look at any area of life, what you eventually need is a heretic who questions everything and says it could be done differently. And in, in the book, I talk about Copernicus, because, of course, mm -hmm. until Copernicus, everybody believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. That's the way they would have said it. And, mm -hmm. and the, everyone believed that the sun went round the Earth and everything else went round the Earth. And they built diagrams and models of how all this worked. It was incredibly complicated, mm -hmm. but they managed to create models, diagrams of exactly how the Earth was at the very center and everything else happened around it. And Copernicus came along, of course, and he said, but that's not true. The sun sits at the center of our solar system, and we're going around this. So, so heretical was all of this. You probably know they put him under house arrest for the rest <laughs> of his life. They <laughs> burned his writings. They wouldn't let this, this heretical view come out because the earth had to be the center of everything. Mm. But of mm. course, in the end, and it took a very long time beyond Copernicus's lifetime, actually, people realized that he was pointing the way to the future and to our understanding of how our universe uh, really works. So we need kind of we need people who break out of the, the rules of the rules, and that's all there is to it. And whether yes. in the world of charity or the world of government or the world of local government, the the, the systems around us that create reality for every child and family and, and elderly people. We need people who say it can be done differently and it needs uh, to be done differently. Yeah. That's the kind of person you are. Hey, listen, it's what I've tried to be. And I know that if I, if I didn't keep on pushing, believing that I could do the job I now do mm. and trying to get people to believe that I could do it, um, I would have lost the very essence of what I'm about because I'm in such a happy space that this is my promised land. This is what I've been dreaming for. This is where I wanted to be. And so the joy it brings me means that I get up every day and I'm smiling every day. You're and when I'm smiling at the world and they're smiling back at me, right? I mean, that is a real wonderful feeling. I can vouch for the fact that at 6.30 in the morning, you are smiling. That's an amazing oh, yeah. thing, which oh, makes yeah. me smile, oh, yeah. actually. So, oh, yeah. so I... So I, I kind of think it's like this. You know, there's lots of people who rationally believe in change needing to be made. But a real change maker 
the person that people follow is someone who's irrational about it. I remember uh, when I was much younger and um, and Oasis was just starting. It was only me and perhaps two or three other people. I used to run a youth group and some of them joined me in uh, in the beginnings of Oasis. And um, and it was really hard work. It's really hard work now. But somebody older and wiser than me said then, they, they said, Steve, what Oasis needs is someone who's irrationally committed to it, and you are that person. But the problem with being irrationally committed to something is that you can't escape it. You give your life to this thing. It possesses you. It takes oh, yeah. you over. And, and he said to me, and this sense of vision you've got for what you want to do is incurable. That's what he said. It's incurable. <laughs> you've got to live with it, the frustration that it creates. Yeah. But you've got to live with it uh, for the rest of your life. And I learned out of that that what I, my job to do and what I believe, you know, Moses, Martin Luther King, et cetera, et cetera, Greta Thunberg, Pankhurst, Gandhi, they embodied what they talked about. It wasn't just that, hey, I've got a theory. What do you think of this theory? You know, do you think it will work? Like they, they ooze. They lived and breathed. Yes. 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 Yeah. And which is why I get disappointed in doctors who sit in front of you, Stevie, and they go, you should be doing the following. And you look at them and you go, well, so should you. So should you. Right. Because in fact, the messenger must believe in the message. Otherwise, there's no credibility behind that message. You know, and that's why if I... <laughs> no, somebody was telling me that just yesterday, actually, because they've yeah. not been well, somebody I know and love, and um, and they, they they I was worried about them, and they'd been to see their GP, and they yeah. said the GP gave them advice about how they needed to lose a few pounds and get a bit yes. of it. But they said <laughs> that this, it was a woman, they said she sat there in front of them she was really overweight and she had a can of coke in her hand and was sitting <laughs> on the couch while she was giving advice about sugar intake i know i know and that is the problem right because you look i live and breathe what i do i believe wholeheartedly and i said it earlier on the movement is medicine i really honestly believe in it because i believe what a condition you have mental physical no matter what it is if you get your body moving, you're able to cope with those conditions so much better. So if you wish, I'm painting a vision of the promised land that I want everybody to go to. I want everybody to say, come on this journey. I'm going to come on this journey. And the point is, you know, here's the difference. People know it exists. People mm. know people who exercise. They know people who work out. They know people who have been able to cure certain ailments because of movement. So it's not difficult. The difficulty is getting them to take that first step, which is almost the same problem that Moses had, is yeah, getting yeah. people to take that first step, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what I'd say about you, Derek, is this, and that's why I asked you to talk to me about this, this chapter, people follow people, not disembodied yeah. principles, because it strikes me, and I've known you for a very long time, of course. I guess we've known each other well, we've known each 30, other. 30 years. Yeah, yeah. And so I've watched over the years how this, what you talk about is embedded in you. Like like Brighton is embedded in a stick of rock, you know, and and, and wherever you chop the rock, you know, you can cut it up or yes, break yeah. it or carve it up. But wherever you cut it, it still says Brighton in. And like yes. it's like... You're like a stick of rock in terms of your what you say about health, well-being, being medicine, yeah, and health and well-being. It's um, it's an amazing, mm. it's an amazing thing. There's a story that always fascinates me, always inspires me. Back in 1464, I talk about this uh, in my book. In 1464, um, a group of men went up into the Italian Alps. And they heaved out of the Alps a giant block of marble. And they brought it down into the city of Florence. They transported it there. And they called it the giant. But this huge piece of marble had a floor running through it. What they wanted to do, though, you know, Florence was the centre of the new movement in art. 
it was the center of the Renaissance. And there were many statues around Florence. There still are. It's a wonderful place to visit. If you're looking for mm -hmm. uh, architecture and art and culture, look no further than Florence. It's, it's an extraordinary mm. city. But they had this giant block of marble, and it sat in the 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 courtyard, the work, the, the working courtyard outside the cathedral there. And they asked a very famous uh, sculptor to uh, to carve it into something beautiful and he worked on it i think for about six months but because of the floor that was running through it he <laughs> gave up and then it stood there for some 10 years just abandoned and then another famous artist there were many of them of course in florence mm. at that time at the time of uh, uh, at the time of this renewal he came to work on it and he worked on it for a few weeks and he gave up. He said it was just too flawed. It was too dangerous to work mm -hmm. on it. And then it sat in that yard. This is an extraordinary thing um, mm -hmm. for another 10 years. And then Leonardo da Vinci came to work on it. <laughs> like this yeah. famous artist, he worked on it for a bit. And then he gave up. And then they say it sat in this yard for another 35 years. No one touched it. And then someone had the idea of asking a young man who was a bit of a novice, who didn't know much about all of this kind of thing. And he came and looked at it. They say he spent three days just walking around it, pondering. And then he started work on it. And he worked on it for almost three years. And his name was Michelangelo. And today, that piece of flawed marble is the most famous uh, statue in the world, the statue of David. People go to Florence just to see the statue of David. I've been, it's as high as a double-decker bus. It is absolutely beautiful. I'd heard people say to me before I'd seen it that once you've seen David in Florence, there's no need to ever look at another statue. Nothing comes close. I thought that was hyperbole. Right. I'm telling you, when you stand in front of it, it blows your mind. How did this young guy do what no one else can do? He was asked the question and he said, mm -hmm. I could see, always see what was inside that block. My job was just to set David free. Amazing. Love it.